Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this Gray Muzzle webinar. My name is Lisa Longhofer. I'm the Executive Director of the Gray Muzzle Organization, and I'm joined by my colleague Amanda Grant. We'll be helping to moderate your questions this afternoon. Um, you can feel free to type your questions into the question box that you should see on the webinar screen. Um, we're also broadcasting live on Facebook, so if you're watching there, you can enter your questions into the comments field. And we are delighted to have advisory board member for the gray muzzle, Dr. Julie Busby, presenting today. Um, Dr. Busby is an integrative veterinarian who seeks to blend the best of Western medicine, alternative therapies, and creative tools for maximum wellness in her patients, the majority of whom have gray muzzles. After years of frustration watching her patients struggle on hard floors, she developed Dr. Busby's toe grips, which are an assistive device that enables instant traction and confident mobility. Dr. Busby is passionate about educating clients on multimodal approaches to improving the quality of life for senior and special needs dogs. And we are delighted that she is here with us today to talk about the difficult topic of saying goodbye to your pup. And so with that, I will turn it over to you, Dr. Busby. Welcome and thank you for being here today. Thank you, Lisa. It seems completely inappropriate to say that I'm glad to be here today talking about saying goodbye to your dog. And I liken it to what so many people say about becoming a veterinarian. I've heard it hundreds of times. I could never become a vet because I could never put dogs to sleep. And yes, it's a very difficult part of the job. It's very emotional. It takes a toll every time a vet is involved with a euthanasia. It hurts us too. But it's also such a great privilege and honor to help that family and to help that dog transition smoothly and peacefully. And so really that's my goal today as well, even though we're not in any exam room or living room and we're not thankfully going through a process of euthanasia, we are going to talk through the process. And hopefully I will be able to deliver counsel, care and comfort for the journey wherever you are. My name is Julie Busby because I'm an alternative uh, veterinarian seeing Clients in this stage of my career, predominantly for chiropractic and acupuncture, as Lisa mentioned, I do see a lot of senior dogs. And so this topic is near and dear to my heart. So this may be you. You might have a senior dog presently, and you might be here because you know that at some point in the future, this is going to be something you wrestle with. Or maybe you're on the other side of the spectrum. Maybe you've recently lost a dog and you're here for, for comfort and and I respect that and I'm so glad that you joined us. I do, I know this was in the information that Lisa sent out about the webinar, but I do just wanna go ahead and put a little trigger warning here that we are going to talk frankly and openly about all aspects of euthanasia because I think conquering the fear of the unknown is a large part of finding peace and comfort in the process and after, and after the euthanasia. So I, I want to say that, and I, I just want to make you aware that if emotionally you don't feel like this is the right place for you, I understand that. But I also want to provide hope and ask you to stay with us. Um, and here's the reason why. This was me last weekend dropping my eldest daughter off at college 15 hours away. I have never known that kind of pain in my entire life, and I wasn't expecting it. And there's a proverb that says, each heart knows, knows its own bitterness. And I don't think even my husband could really understand what I was feeling as a mom. But driving home, I was talking to um, a veterinary technician at a large referral hospital. I had sent a patient there and we had to confer on something. And she said, oh, the client told me that you're dropping off your, your daughter at college. And out of the blue, she just said, I, I, that pain was so acute for me. I didn't even know what to do with it. And she went on to describe her pain and I thought, wow, you understand me. And that's the parallel I wanna to draw today. Perhaps you have had relatives or friends say things that were hurtful about how much um, grief you experienced in the loss of your dog or how much you um, fear losing your dog. But I want you to know that you're safe here, you're heard, you're seen because all of our hearts are in unison and recognizing how significant um, our dogs are in our lives and what a gigantic hole 
they leave um, when they're gone. In fact, studies have shown that losing a pet can be more traumatic for people and take more of an emotional toll on mental health and emotional health than losing an extended family member. And I mean, pets live with us constantly. They're, they're in our beds, they're in our lives, they're in our hearts. And it's a tremendous loss. And, and I acknowledge that. And I hope that we can talk through that and find some healing today. So here's the roadmap. This is what we're going to be doing. First of all, signs that your dog is dying. I want you to be aware of what to be looking for. How can I be sure that it's time? And I put that in quotes because we all talk about, you know, when is it time? How can you prepare for that euthanasia appointment? How do you handle the grief and maybe mom guilt? And then I'll share the story of losing our, our own dog recently, Luke, and then some concluding thoughts. But what I have come to learn really, I've been a vet for 23 years, but very acutely recently, and I'll explain why in a little bit, I have learned that there is harm, I think, for both ends of the leash. Ultimately, how things go for the dog and certainly how things go for that human if we treat this topic as taboo and we don't discuss it. I think it's really important to bring this to light. So um, after a conversation with a friend of mine who you're gonna meet later in this slide presentation, I wrote a blog that was called Grieving the Loss of a Dog After Euthanasia and Finding Peace. And I had no idea what kind of a chord that would strike. Um, it's been shared, it was just a month or two ago that we posted it. It's been shared over 4,000 times and that and a sister blog on the same topic um, have had like 70 some comments. And the overwhelming message in the comments is that people are struggling with grief and guilt from, from euthanasias of beloved dogs that may have happened years prior. And a lot of those center around a lack of understanding, a lack of communication, a frustration that I think could have been resolved. And um, so that's, again, my motivation for doing this presentation and really making this something that's very important to me. We've actually put together an ebook. And if you stay to the end of the presentation, you'll get a free copy on this very topic because I'm just realizing how important it is uh, for people to be able to read and understand this material at their own pace and and at, at a time when they're not in the throes of grief and making decisions. So let's jump right in with what are the signs my dog may be terminally ill. I just finished the ebook. It just actually was published in time for, for this presentation. So I sent a rough draft to my aunt last week because she sent me a message, a text while I was on my college trip that said, um, I think her dog is 16 and she said it's time for Tyson. I just, I, I made an appointment and it's gonna be in a few days because that's when the vet's available. And I said, well, I just finished this ebook. I would love to send it to you in the hopes that it would be helpful to you. And she wrote back afterwards and she said, thankfully that it was very helpful, but she said in reading it, I realized that probably I waited too long. And that's something that um, as veterinarians, we just really wanna help people avoid if possible. Certainly, um, I know my clients always have their dog's best interest at heart. But sometimes well-meaning clients just are so unable to let go that they make decisions that are not necessarily the best decisions for the dog. And that's our job in, as veterinarians to help guide, ultimately the decision is there, but to help guide them during those times. So I want you to be aware of these signs and be in tune to them. And frankly, these signs are just important for you to know as a dog owner of any dog, because they're just a, a measure of your dog's health. So first of all, we have the difference between objective measures and subjective measures. Subjective measures are things that you determine by opinion. How's your dog's appetite? How's, he, how's his energy level? Objective measures are those that can be quantified. And so this information is from a blog on our website, um, toegrips.com. We have a blog that we publish a weekly and most of the information is pertains to senior dog health and wellness. And so this is in one of the blogs if you'd like to find it. But I want to point out specifically heart rate and respiratory rate for dogs because these are objective measures of pain, of shock, of distress. If your dog has an elevated heart rate and respiratory rate at rest, so obviously it's going to be elevated after exercise or excitement, but at rest, if your dog has an elevated heart rate or respiratory rate, it's worth reaching out to your vet about because it's an objective measure of something that's amiss. This is um, Luke, the dog that I mentioned in the um, kind of the table of contents who we're going to talk about at the end. And this is a hard video for me to show you. I told you this was going to be raw stuff. 
but it's an important video because as a veterinarian, I look at this and it's so obvious to me, but um, it may not be obvious to everyone. And so I wanna point this out and show you um, Luke's breathing. Uh, this was probably a day or two before we said goodbye to Luke. And I want you to notice that his breathing, and you can obviously tell from his facial expression that he's not feeling well, he's on my daughter's bed, but look at his breathing here. And I want you to note that he's not really breathing just from his chest. He's breathing from his belly. We call this abdominal breathing. And this is always an indicator of something concerning and honestly more so in cats than dogs. But this is breathing that's abnormal. And um, obviously respiratory distress, respiratory issues. And again, I mentioned cardiac issues, a heart rate that's too high are things that you need to follow up with your vet about. This is another one of my patients. And this dog, again, you can look at the facial expression and you say, you know, something's wrong with this dog. This dog's not feeling good. But this is a dog who is very active, living in a home with several other dogs. And the dog um, had an issue that ended up being diagnosed as a spinal cord tumor. It took a while to figure that out because it was obviously very advanced diagnostics that finally um, made the diagnosis. But this dog started isolating herself from the family and spending more and more time in her bed. And these behavioral changes, not just physiological changes, but they're also red signs um, that should be paid attention to. And I know you guys, I'm preaching to the choir here. I know you're probably well aware of all this, but just good to keep in the back of your mind that changes in your dog's behavior often warrant a vet visit to discuss. This is another dog that, um, this is a stock photo. I don't know this dog, so I can't tell why this dog has dilated pupils, but that's why I put this in here. There are some physiologic reasons, like for example, certain toxicities that would cause dilated pupils. But I look at this dog and I say, this is either a dog who's afraid or a dog who's in pain. So dilated pupils, change in facial expression, another symptom of pain. And I put this in here because if I had, if a client called me and said, I think my dog's seriously ill or seriously injured, there's something very, it's a, a serious um, issue with my dog. And I was only able to ask one question to determine whether or not the dog, in fact, was uh, you know, an emergent situation. I think I would ask, what's your dog's gum color? I think that might be my one question. It is so important to know the baseline. So your dogs that are happy, healthy at home, I would encourage you to just get in the habit of lifting up that lip and knowing what baseline looks like. We want nice, pink, healthy gums. This dog, in fact, has those, but the dog also has a lot of pigment. That's the black stuff all over the gum tissue. And so you want to know where in your dog you can find pink mucous membranes and you want to know what that normal baseline color is. Problems that, uh, colors and shades that are a problem include pale gums. We also see shades of gray and blue and these are usually emergency situations. Also, we see do problems with dog's abdomens. I'm palpating a dog's abdomen here and any sort of vomiting, diarrhea, tenseness to the belly, change in posture, warrant a call to the vet because these can be indicators of serious health issues. And again, whether or not the dog's terminally ill from these problems, really a vet would have to determine, but you can start to look at these indicators and kind of put puzzle pieces together. This is from um, Colorado State University. This is a pain scale that they put together and there's lots of these out there today, but I just wanted to point out if you look across the top, I know there's a lot of writing, but if you look across the top, Ultimately, what they're, they're measuring is the dog's behavior, the dog's psychological health, the dog's response to palpation or response to touch, and then the dog's body ten tension, which would be manifested in stuff like posture and facial expression. So you see those down on the, the left-hand side going from zero to four. And just again, being in tune with your dog, being a conscientious pet owner, this is probably very, um, just intuitive for you, but it's, it's nice to be able to actually scale it and, and quantitate it when you're communicating with your vet about your concerns. I want to throw in here um, idiopathic geriatric vestibular disease. Idiopathic means we don't know the cause. Geriatric meaning it happens predominantly in older dogs. Vestibular refers to that system of balance in the body, so vertigo is a vestibular problem, and then it's called a disease or a syndrome. I wrote an article on the gray muzzle blog. It's called Gray Matters, and you can search for it there on vestibular disease. 
but I would guess there's probably like an ocean's worth of tears that have been uh, cried from senior dog owners about this condition because it looks horrific. These dogs are older, uh, often they're mistaken as having a stroke. They are off balance. So they're walking like drunken sailors. Their eyes are, are um, usually shifting like a typewriter back and forth. They may be nauseous. Sometimes they actually fall on the ground and roll over. They're so dizzy and their balance is so off. And I think it's important for every senior dog owner to be aware of this condition. Obviously it's a diagnosis that your vet would make, but just to be aware, it's my favorite diagnosis to make because it looks so horrific. And yet these dogs tend to do very well with supportive care and time and go back to living a very normal life. And, and I didn't mention a head tilt, that's often a symptom as well. And that may be the only thing that's residual. So just to be aware that this is something that can happen in senior dogs and it's not a sign that your dog is terminal. I also wanna mention referral to specialists. Um, no matter how good your vet is, I'm speaking on behalf of myself, certainly, um, we don't know everything. And, it's, and most of us are in general practice seeing a lot of different things. And so it's so nice when we can take a case that we are not able to figure out or may need advanced care that we're not, not able to provide and refer to a specialist. This is Auburn uh, University Veterinary School. This was a family day tour and just top of the line facilities there. So whether it be at a um, veterinary hospital or a private referral center, I think it's really important to remember that you always have this option. If you have a senior dog who is maybe um, seriously ill and the diagnosis is black and white, I'm not speaking to you about this really. It's for maybe the senior dog where the diagnosis is elusive and your dog is, has not been concretely diagnosed. You really don't know what's going wrong. It's similar to the dog that I showed you a slide of earlier who was in the bed. That dog had to be referred to a specialist um, for the diagnosis. And ultimately that was really important. The dog suffered um, for a while before we were able to figure out the diagnosis. And the diagnosis gives us both the ideal treatment regimen and also a prognosis, which is expected outcome. So remember that this is, also, this is always an option. Uh, another place that I use this for senior dogs is dogs that have really horrific dental disease and the general practitioner doesn't feel comfortable, understandably so, putting under anesthesia a 17 year old dog to have a dental procedure and yet the dentistry is an issue for quality of life. So referral to a specialty facility. I just sent a patient last week where a board sort of, this dog has kidney issues and I didn't want to be involved with this anesthesia. So a board certified um, veterinary anesthesiologist ran the anesthesia for that dog to be able to have her procedure and have her teeth clean, which was really important to her quality of life and I think also her longevity. Let's move to the next point, which is how can I be sure it's time? And uh, really the answer is you would need a crystal ball to know for sure. But I don't believe that there's like one moment in time that's the perfect moment for most dogs, most senior dogs where it's age and de degenerative related changes that end up leading to the decision. I believe you have a window of time. And so I, I think, as I mentioned earlier, keeping in mind selflessness is just so important. Ultimately, it's what's best for the dog. What, and I find myself so often at euthanasia appointments telling my clients as I hug them, I am so heartbroken for you, but I'm not sad for your dog. Your dog is gonna be so much better off because they have recognized that this is the right thing to do for their dog and they're letting them go at their own expense of, of being left behind and grieving that loss. It's also important to point out that life is not like Hollywood. Um, by that, I mean, so many clients over the years have told me, I'm just gonna wait until she passes in her sleep. And that rarely happens. Ultimately, it's usually a decision that we have to take responsibility for. I think if we let dogs just pass naturally in their sleep, they would live weeks to months, possibly even years longer than would be humane for them in many, many cases. So unfortunately, I don't think that that's a legitimate thought. I mean, we all pray that that happens, but more often than not, it's a conscious decision that we have to make for their benefit. But in that, I wanna encourage you to treasure every moment. Your dog can read you like a book. So if you feel like the time is short, 
and you're having anxiety over when that time is going to be, your dog's reading that and that's affecting both of you. So if the time is short, so be it. Uh, obviously that is very painful, but try to still enjoy the moments with your dog. You'll create precious memories that'll help sustain you um, in the time after the loss. I would also encourage you to talk openly with family members, including children about what's happening. I'm often surprised uh, about the discussion that clients get into in a exam room when I open the euthanasia discussion. And it seems like it sort of opens the door and gives them permission. It's, it's how it appears that suddenly they now have permission to discuss it amongst themselves. And then no discussion was happening at home. I understand that it's much easier to avoid painful topics, but I think that only compounds the pain. So being able to discuss um, how other family members feel the dog is doing, being able to discuss how um, they would like to see things um, end in terms of what we're gonna talk about in a little bit, the place and whether or not they're included, and also talking openly with children about what's going on. Children are so perceptive and they know they're so much more resilient than we give them credit for. And I would encourage you to include them as well in the discussions. And then lastly, document progress for reflection. So when is it time? One really smart veterinary technician um, gave me the tip of putting, telling clients to put out two jars, two penny jars. So for every day that the dog was just having a stellar day and feeling great, you put a penny in the feeling great jar. For every day that you felt like, you know what, my dog's just not feeling good today, it's not a good day, you put a penny in that jar. And you can quickly, tangibly see things kind of add up over time. I love having um, my clients keep journals for their dogs. It's great for dogs that are prone to seizures. For allergy dogs, it's important to kind of document over time what's happening. But for senior dogs as well, sometimes it's hard to, in the moment, make decisions and be able to think back over time. But if you have a journal where you can look for changes and kind of track points on a line, it'll be much more helpful for you and your veterinarian to real realistically discuss your dog's progress and your dog's future. Also, of course, lean on your veterinarian. Your veterinarian is there for you to have these discussions. They are kind of a little removed emotionally. Certainly they're emotionally vested, believe you me, but they're a little bit removed. And obviously they're the professionals who um, want to be there to answer your questions and guide you and, and help you and advocate for what's best for your dog. In this day and age of telemedicine, this is Dr. Freeman who um, invented a company called Pet Triage and I have no connection to them. I just put the slide in because it's a really cool company that allows you to put symptoms in about your dog and then have triage happen instantly and be able to talk with a veterinarian on the spot if you need to. Many veterinary offices are offering this, but this is like a national service. But telemedicine is so good for dogs who are on hospice care for senior dogs because without having to get them in the vehicle and into the office, if you just want to discuss quality of life, maybe titrating, adding or subtracting medications, talk to a veterinarian about your concerns about if it's time or when it's time, that can be done very easily through telemedicine. There's of course times when a veterinarian has to get their hands on the dog, but for much of this, it's, it's consult based and discussion based and telemedicine, especially in the day and age of COVID is such a great resource. All right, next we're gonna talk about how can you prepare for that appointment? I mean, we're now talking about the nitty gritty of that moment in time when we're letting the dog go. And I think we ultimately wanna create the best day we can for that dog. And I put our best week or best month. I'm always amazed at the dogs who kind of get to do their bucket list tour at the end of their life. And you know, not only are these best days and weeks and months and trips, great for the dog. I mean, they're just having the time of their life, but they're so good for the people. Those memories are so precious. And so I want you to be able to create both. So the first thing I would say is script the treats. Obviously in the days leading up to a euthanasia, you don't want to be giving your dog tons of junk because you may end up with a whole separate problem of pancreatitis or gastroenteritis, and you don't want to be dealing with that and making your dog not feel good. But at the actual appointment, when it's the time is nigh, you can feed your dog whatever you like. I actually learned this part of this idea from a veterinarian I met who said, at all of our euthanasia appointments, we offer the dog chocolate bar. And he said, it was so funny because the dogs look at you like, what, you've been holding out on me all this time? 
So I understand that not every dog at this stage even has an appetite, but to be able to give the dog some special treat moments before the euthanasia, I think brings joy to the dog and it brings joy to us too, as we bring them joy and creates a special memory. Think about scripting the comfort. I'm gonna skip ahead one slide because this may mean a home euthanasia. And this is really, in my opinion, the best option if it's possible. Um, there's an organization called Lap of Love, which has veterinarians all around the country that specialize in hospice and end of life care for dogs and home euthanasias. That's the biggest one. There are others and, and veterinary hospitals who just offer this as a service for their patients. But even if that's not an option for whatever reason, no judgment, um, if you prefer to go to the veterinary hospital or, or you cannot have a home euthanasia, then think about scripting the comfort of that appointment. This may mean that your dog would be happiest if the euthanasia could happen right in your lap in the car or maybe somewhere outside. I have euthanized dogs at my veterinary practice um, in a field nearby. I mean, just trying to do whatever makes that dog happy and comfortable. If you're gonna be in the office, um, hopefully there's a comfort room where you can be on the floor with the dog, bring your dog's bed along, bring your dog's favorite toy or comfort item and just think about how you can make those moments in, uh, at that appointment just special and comfortable and very relaxed for your dog. And then think about, we talked about the setting, whether it be at home or um, I recently saw a, a euthanasia uh, veterinarian posted that she had done a euthanasia at like a riverbed for this dog that was a, that loved to hike with his family. And so they set that up and that's where they said goodbye to their dog. I, my point is that you have options. And again, even if it's at the veterinary hospital, you still have options of bringing some props, if you will, to make it more comfortable. And then think about the people who are gonna be there, not only for your dog's sake, who would your dog want there, but which people need to be there for that closure. And that's very personal, it's a family decision. Certainly you wanna answer hard questions ahead of time. It's almost like having, like writing your will. Um, you want to not be thinking about, because it's difficult to even put conscious thoughts together and make decisions in the throes of, of grief. So you want to be thinking ahead of time about all these things. Where do you want this to happen? Who needs to be there? And one of those decisions is, is the care of the body. So burial is an option depending on zoning in your specific area, but um, typically burial is an option that requires you to take the body home with you. And then there's cremation, both communal where you don't get the ashes back in private, which is much more expensive, but you do get the ashes back. And many of my clients prefer to go that route. Certainly enjoy a last walk together. Um, before the appointment, allow lots of extra time to just take that last walk together. Again, it's gonna be the hardest walk of your life, but it's a precious memory. And the other reason I suggest this is it's nice for the dog to be able to empty his bowels and bladder before the procedure so that he's more comfortable when he's laying um, and being worked on. And then also after euthanasia, one of the things that happens is typically the dog will release uh, his bowels and his bladder. And so there might be feces or urine. And it's just more pleasant if that doesn't happen, you know, while you're grieving, one less thing you have to think about. And so a walk beforehand, I think just serves many purposes. I just want to run down a few vet pro tips, if you will. And these are really in the weeds. These are nitty gritty. But I want you to know this because again, I, my hope is that it will help you know what to expect and know what to be thinking about and not be wondering. So first of all, if you're a regular client of the vet, they may just be fine billing you, which is ideal. But if not, um, you probably are gonna have to sign some paperwork ahead of time and just send your credit card along with it so that you can pay ahead of time. No one wants to be finished with a euthanasia appointment and have to walk up to the counter with tears streaming down their face and have to take care of a bill. So do whatever you can to avoid that. Most of the time, the vet is going to suggest putting in an IV catheter, that's standard operating procedure for many veterinarians, because it's only one poke and done. So um, once that IV is in, so the dog, there is one pinch, but once that IV is in, any further injections that need to happen can go, that need to go right into the vein can go through the IV so your dog won't feel anything. And more importantly, a lot of times these older frail dogs have difficult veins to hit. 
more importantly, there's guaranteed access once that IV is set in the vein so that those injections happen smoothly without um, the possibility of, of missing the vein, which really causes a delay in the procedure and potential pain to the dog if the injection is not put right into the vein. When we put an IV in, we usually shave the dog, which generates some fur. And so if you'd be interested in keeping that when the dog goes for the IV, you can say, hey, can you just save the fur for me if that's something you would like? And they would be happy to do that, I'm sure. Today, most, uh, it's actually recommended by the boards that put together protocols for veterinarians to sedate a dog prior to euthanasia. Not everybody does, and we're gonna talk about that in a little bit. But the advantage of sedation is that your dog is just perfectly relaxed, perfectly calm, and there's not any anxiety, pain, um, unexpected movement, and it kind of just allows the euthanasia appointment to be um, very standard, and that means peaceful and, and pain-free for your dog. One thing I do want to point out, and um, this was pointed out to me by, by Jamie, who you're going to meet in a couple of slides, her dog was sedated um, for, the euth for a euthanasia appointment, and she didn't realize that the sedation, and, and I think this is true, I have not done a good job of telling clients this, the sedation isn't just, I'm going to take the edge off and your dog's going to you know, be like he had one cocktail at night. It's heavy sedation. It's almost to the point of being able to do a spay or neuter on the dog, typically. And so she felt like she didn't have the opportunity to say a proper goodbye to her dog because she wasn't expecting that from the sedation. She wanted the opportunity to hold her dog's face and look in her dog's eyes and say goodbye. And after the sedation, the dog was so out of it that she felt like she missed that moment. And so keep in mind that those things that you need to say need to be done typically before the sedation because after that, it's gonna be very much um, a procedure where the dog is really not fully conscious. However, I love sedation again because it just makes it very, very, very peaceful and smooth for the dog and, and therefore their family. What I encourage Jamie with while we talked through this for her is that even a sedated dog, we believe can still hear. Um, we know that in the process of dying from humans that hearing is the lost sense to be, the last sense to be lost. And so I would encourage you to keep talking to your dog, keep petting your dog. I believe they will, they will know your presence, they will know your intention and, and just keep talking to them uh, right through the very end and stay calm. I know that's easier said than done. I'm not telling you not to grieve and not to weep, but your dog will read you. And so if you are full of anxiety, your dog will also feel anxious. So do the best you can um, to stay calm for your dog's sake. And I say, don't remove the collar. I don't mean don't take it home with you, but I sometimes see people get into a euthanasia appointment. They're in the exam room and they want to take the collar home. So they take it off right there at the beginning of the procedure. And that triggers the dog's mind. I mean, why'd you take my collar off? Something's happening. You know, you just undressed me. We don't want to stress the dog. We don't want to trigger their mind to think anything except for you're just here being loved on, being cared for, maybe eating a chocolate bar. And so remove the collar after the euthanasia. Now, this is again, nitty gritty, but I would, I want to tell you that after that your dog has passed, and some of you may have already experienced this, we talked about some changes in the body first, that there may be urination, there may be um, a loss of bowel control, and those are normal things. Your dog won't close his eyes. Again, it's not like Hollywood where they just close their eyes and pass and, you know, and it looks perfectly sanitary. The, the dog doesn't close, um, doesn't close the eyes. And there may be muscle fasciculations, and these can be really scary if you don't know what they are. These are perfectly normal, but as the cells just die from lack of oxygen and buildup of um, metabolic waste, the muscles may actually twitch and shake. And um, your veterinarian at that point would likely have already told you by listening with the stethoscope that's gonna happen right after the euthanasia injection that your dog has passed. And so this is not something conscious. This is involuntary reflexes, and I would not want you to be alarmed. Once your dog, once that injection has gone IV of the penobarbital, the euthanasia solution, your dog has passed, has gone on to, to better place. And I obviously 
couldn't tell you the details of that, but I believe with my whole heart that the pain and the um, just the lack of freedom those senior dogs are experiencing in their frail bodies is, is a thing of the past for them. And then don't feel rushed to leave that appointment. You are welcome to stay as long as you like in that, if you're in the room or wherever you may be. Again, this is one of the advantages of home euthanasia. You take your time, whatever time you and your family need um, with your dog's body at that point, take your time and leave when you need to. Don't feel like you need to get out right away. So what about the guilt and grief? And this is just really important for me to talk about, again, again, especially in light of the blog and the comments. And this is Jamie that I've been promising to talk about, my friend Jamie, and she's the one that opened this can of worms. I was driving one day down the road and we were talking about something else work related. And she said, can I ask you a question? And I said, sure. And she told me the tale of, of her two dogs euthanasias, two senior Cocker Spaniels, Remy and Sabrina. And Sabrina was frail when she was euthanized and the vet didn't do a sedation injection because I suspect the dog was so frail that he, he um, she was pretty critically ill at that point. Jamie was traveling and just needed to, to let her go. And I suspect the vet knew that the dog was so frail that there wasn't even a need for sedation, that she was so weak that he could just give the, the one uh, euthanasia injection and that, would all, that was all that was needed. So Jamie did have her time to hold Sabrina and to look into her eyes and to tell her all, all the things she needed to say before the vet said, are you ready for the injection and, and then give the euthanasia solution. Remedy on the other hand, did have the sedation injection. And this is what I described earlier, where Jamie was surprised at how sedated she became and felt like she missed that opportunity um, to say goodbye. But she also was concerned, which is the right way to do it? Did one dog suffer more than the other? Was, was one way, way right versus the other way wrong? And I encouraged her with, with a clean conscience that I believe this to be true. I think both dog, both veterinarians did what they believed were the best for that pet at that time. And this is where um, that trust factor comes in. You wanna always have a relationship with a veterinarian that you can trust their word and, um, so I think in both cases, there wasn't a right or a wrong, but I think communication um, could possibly have been better and expectations. And again, that's why we're doing this seminar today. So that not only can you understand the big picture, but maybe it'll help you also with asking um, questions regarding what to expect. Most of my clients are so like Jamie are so dedicated um, to their pets. This is one of my acupuncture patients and they are prone, I think by very virtue of their sincere desire to see their dogs thrive, they're prone to this mom guilt phenomenon. And yet these people get up throughout the hours of the night to take care of their senior dogs. They bring them for acupuncture and chiropractic and they certainly take much better care of them than they do themselves. And so there's no room for mom guilt. I try to assure them that we do the best we can with the information that we have. And I mentioned trust earlier. Your dog trusts you. I mean, that is just implicit in the relationship. Your dog trusts you to care for him. And you need to have a relationship of, and I trust that you do, of trust with your veterinarian to guide you and to just hold your hand through all your dog's life stages, but certainly through this most difficult phase. And on some level, I would just encourage you to know that you have done the best you could with the information that you had, and that's enough. It's, it's enough. I wanna end with the story of Luke. I know this picture is a little blurry, but this, this daughter that I just dropped off at college at the age of 18, uh, we adopted Luke when she was 10 and he was her dog. And I found this and I thought it was so sweet. She wrote this story about him that he was found on the streets of Savannah and he was in a kill shelter, but now he, he didn't have a good mommy, but now he lives in a house with a good mommy. And just like your dogs, he became a very integral part of our family. This is a human birthday cake for him. We would always do a birthday, a doggy birthday cake that was safe for him. And then we would get a human cake also so we could celebrate with him. And I'll never forget checking out at the grocery store and the cashier saying to one of my sons, oh, happy birthday, are you Luke? And they said, no, Luke's the dog. And uh, so we celebrated every year. And sadly, Luke's life wasn't long enough. He was only seven years old 
when he was, um, when Abigail noticed, certainly not this breathing, this was, this was after he was diagnosed, but just initially she said, no, I think Luke's breathing is a little off. And I listened to him with the stethoscope and I looked at him and I didn't see anything wrong. And the next day she said, he coughed a little bit overnight and my heart just sank. Somehow I just intuitively knew, even though there's a lot of reasons for coughing in dogs, that some, something was not right and that this was serious. And so um, we did x-rays, we went and saw um, a board certified uh, radiologist who did an ultrasound and diagnosed a tumor in Luke's chest. He had lymphoma. And lymphoma is actually one of the more treatable cancers in dogs, except for if it's in the mediastinum in the chest, that's a more difficult one to treat. And so we were told by an oncologist uh, that we could do chemotherapy and Luke would live maybe an additional three to six months. Again, for lymphoma in general, the prognosis, there's lots of amazing treatments and um, I'm a huge believer in consulting with a veterinary oncologist, but this specific type, the prognosis was grim. And my daughter, Abigail, who was Luke's mom, um, she was so mature. She said, ultimately, I know what I want to do for me, but I look at Luke and you saw his face on that bed. She said, I look at Luke and I know he's, he's not himself. He's not happy with his life and I want to do what's best for him. And so we did palliative care and we did some medications and we treated him for as long as we could keep him comfortable. Then we had a tough time keeping him eating. And then right around Christmas, it became very clear to everyone that it was time. And that was, a, that was when that video was taken. And so Abigail said, you know, I, I, wanna, I want Luke to be able to go and not live like this any longer. And I didn't feel comfortable doing that euthanasia for obvious reasons. And a colleague came to our house. One thing we knew is that Luke was happiest with his family. And so we wanted to have the procedure done right in our living room. And a colleague of mine um, came and did that. And this was the kid saying goodbye. You can see the motion in his tail in this picture. He was such a sweet boy. He was wagging his tail. They're saying their goodbyes. And I was holding it all together because that's the vet's job and that's the mom's job. And one of these kids just out of the blue said, now I lay me down to sleep. Pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. And I lost it at that moment. Um, it was very hard for our family. And I can certainly speak with empathy when I say I know how hard it is to say goodbye. And so I don't want to leave you on that note. I want to leave you on the note of seeking peace and finding peace um, when this is over. I, I, it almost sounds silly to say that I know your dog would want you to, to go on and live in peace. And as I read through the dozens and dozens of comments of people that were just wrestling with just feeling like fit, they, they had failed their dog at the end. I just wanted to hug them and say, you did the best you could. You had, you did the best you could with what you had. And I think your dog would be proud of you for that. I don't think, I don't think your dog would want you to live in grief and, um, and all this pain for, for years after. So my prayer in this presentation is that somewhere in here, you will find something if you've been one of those people who have been long suffering to find peace. And we had a um, funeral service for Luke. It was very interesting. The other two dogs that we have, Zeke and Jake, they handled his passing very differently. I did invite them to come in and say goodbye, um, both before and after he passed. And the older dog, Zeke, knew immediately. He, walked, he, he actually didn't even want to come in the room. He intuitively knew. But the puppy, Jake, he came in and he actually sort of started pawing Luke's hindquarters after he had passed. He was oblivious. He wanted Luke to play with him. But after a while, he figured out that Luke wasn't going to play with him. And it was almost like he realized what had happened. And he put his, he laid down and he put his paws between his, you know, his head between his paws. And he just, he mourned. He, he um, vocalized. It was hard for all of us. And we had a little graveside service with our dogs. And I later found this, um, this prayer. It's, it's a liturgy for loss of a living thing, certainly loss of a dog. And these are two lines from it that brought me comfort. Our hearts are unprepared for such loss and we are deeply grieved. Comfort us, O oh Lord, for the ache of these days is real. So I found a lot of comfort in, the, um, in the, this prayer, this liturgy, and it's included, um, reprinted with permission in the back of the ebook. 
I certainly want to dedicate um, the content of today's webinar to all of the dogs we've lost who will forever live in our, in our hearts. And thank you again for taking the time to join me for this really heavy topic. And as promised, um, this is the ebook, Saying Goodbye to Your Dog, Counsel, Care, and Comfort for the Journey. It covers much of what we've discussed today, but it's a free resource, no strings attached. Um, I just want you to, to have this, share this with friends, relative, na relatives, neighbors. Um, I just want, and certainly your own veterinarians, I know just by virtue of the fact that veterinarians, they're amazing giving big hearted people, your own veterinarians, I'm sure, are doing a very excellent job helping you navigate this. But if this resource can help you on, on top of the information you've already been given, all the better. I will say that um, you can get this by going to towgrips.com. That's our website. And in the upper right, clicking shop now, and you'll see all of our products. And at the bottom is the book. You can click on it. It's zero dollars and zero cents. I did put a donation option on that site. And that is because I know many of you are looking for a way to honor your dog's life or to celebrate your dog's memory. And I could think of no better way to do that than to donate to the Gray Muzzle Organization, which is dedicated to helping at-risk senior dogs. And so there's a donation tab there that links directly to the Gray Muzzle Organization. And when you go there um, on the page that you fill out, there's a place to write your dog's name and a tribute to your dog. And at this point, my time is up and I would love to take your questions. And I wanna just thank you again for, for being with us today. Oh, thank you so much, Dr. Busby. That was a really powerful presentation and we really truly appreciate you sharing not only your, your professional wisdom and advice, but also your, your personal journey. Um, it was really meaningful and helpful. We have a lot of great feedback um, from our Facebook friends here who really appreciated all that you shared. Amanda, do we have any questions um, in the chat box or the question box? I do not have any questions right now. Okay. Um, I don't see any other specific questions in on our Facebook page, um, but we do have a couple more minutes. So if anyone does have questions, please feel free to um, to post them. Any other final thoughts, Dr. Busby? No, just what I started with. This isn't the kind of thing that I say, gosh, I'm so excited to be here today to talk about this, but I do think it's really important and I'm deeply grateful for the opportunity and thankful for everybody who who came and hopefully um, was helped a little bit for themselves and maybe can help other um, pet parents through this as well, because I do think it's a, I think there's a collective heart. And as I said, I think that we understand each other uniquely and in, in just how painful this loss is. Couldn't agree more. We have uh, lots of again. words of praise popping up, lots of thank yous. All right. Well, I think that people are certainly, they, we continue to have lots of comments on Facebook thanking you, Dr. Busby, for your time and again for your, your compassion and your, your wisdom and your insight. So um, I hope that many of you will um, take advantage of the ebook. Um, I'm just looking, we have a question coming in. I have a question that just came in, Lisa. Okay. Someone asked, she says she has a pet sitting business and she also mourns for her clients. Any suggestions on how to mourn that way? Mm. Unfortunately, I'm not a grief counselor, but just from personal life experience, I feel like one of the best ways to handle grief is to give. So I think as you give to those clients who are grieving the loss of their dog and support them in their grief, I, my guess is that it will be healing for you. But as, as a professional who also grieves along with all of my clients, my heart is with you. I understand what you're saying.
Any other questions, Amanda? I see lots more thank yous. Yes, lots more thank yous and somebody that donates in honor or in memory of dogs to gray muzzles. So thanks for that. All right. Um, um, I think we will wrap up then. Um, we really appreciate everyone who joined us today. And thank you, Dr. Busby, again for joining us and for sharing um, all the great information that you shared. I think it's extremely valuable and important and a topic that, that we don't discuss enough. So thank you for doing a great service for um, for our audience today and thank all of you. Thanks to all of you who tuned in. We will have a link to the recorded broadcast available later this afternoon. You can go to our website graymuzzle.org to find that um, under the resources tab. And if you have any questions or further comments, please feel free to to reach out to us. All right. Thank you, everyone. Have a good afternoon. Thank you, Dr. Busby. Thanks. All right. Bye-bye, everybody.